What was bad for the state was bad in the eyes of God for that in their minds. Christ comes into this mix. And in today's gospel, very deliberately, he stays at this well, the well of Jacob, which used to be theirs, but now became the place where the Samaritans have settled. In the middle of the day, now we don't have to draw water, we have plumbing, but no one went in the middle of the day to draw water. They went in the morning, so they would have it throughout the day. Wealthier people had even some kind of primitive forms of plumbing in their homes, but the poor people didn't have it. Christ sits and tells the disciples, go and get what to eat, and he waits at the well to encounter this particular woman. She approaches the well in the middle of the day. Why? Maybe to avoid other people, to avoid being seen. And she sees Christ. And immediately in her heart, there had to be some, uh oh, some fear. There's a Jew, a man. Here I am alone. Well, and what happened? Christ breaks that taboo again and again and again. In this case, he speaks to her. A man speaking to a woman who's alone. The apostles were used to that. He had his female apostles, his women apostles that traveled with him and conversed with him freely every day. There was no limit, there was no bounds to their accessibility to Christ. So the apostles had already dealt with that in their Old Testament mindset that said men shouldn't talk to women who aren't their relatives, let alone to women at her time of the month. Broke that tip. Crushed it, shattered it, crumbled. Now he speaks to this woman, who is not only a woman, but is a Samaritan. And it says that she's astonished that he would speak to her. Not only does he speak to her, but he asks her to draw him water from the well. Jews would never drink from a pot that belonged to a Samaritan. The dive of thirst, thirst. And then this conversation ensues. It's a very long gospel from the fourth chapter of John. Generally, the gospel pericopes on Sundays are not this long. And this conversation takes place, and it seems as though they're talking back and forth to each other, and, and, and they're not, they're talking past each other. Christ says, give me water. He says, how are you talking to me? Give you water and what? You didn't bring anything. And this conversation starts. If you knew who I was, and you knew the great gift of God that you had, you would ask me for water, and I would give you water that would be living and spring up to eternal life. In her mind, it sounded good, but what did it mean? Was he going to give her plumbing in her home? Maybe. We don't know really much. We're talking past each other. And slowly, slowly, Christ is revealing himself to her. He's slowly raising her up. As he talks, she continues to think he's talking about water that will save her, the work of going to the well of Jacob, that would save her work and energy and time, that wouldn't necessitate her having to sneak there for some reason, which we don't know yet. Instead of going where all the other women went, because it was women's work to draw water from the well. Instead of going then, she's going on her own. She had this mindset that was purely carnal, purely uh, for dealing with her physical needs, her earthly needs. And he slowly, and that's why it's a whole gospel, slowly he raises her up. Slowly he brings her to a higher knowledge, a higher understanding of what he's speaking about. Because what he's speaking about, brothers and sisters, is the water of baptism. Because all of these gospels of these last few weeks our post-baptismal catechesis, commonly called mystagogical, the, the revealing of the mysteries, a catechesis to the neophytes, those who were baptized in Pasch, usually on Holy Saturday or Lazarus Saturday. 
those who received God, those who entered into the church. You know, it's like I said before, they didn't have a, a literature table in the back of the church that expounded on all of the theology of the church, including the teachings about the, the kingdom of heaven and the Holy Spirit and the most holy day of focus. They didn't reveal that. They were a church under persecution, worshiping in bunkers, worshiping in catacombs, worshiping in their homes, and at any moment could be arrested and killed like Stephen was. We see that, that fear in today's reading of the Acts as well, Acts of the Apostles. So the church has these gospels set up for us. And think about water. Last week was the, the sheep's pool. The man who was healed at the, the, at the pool that was used to wash sheep that would be offered uh, as a sacrifice in the temple. And once a year, Father Robert was here last week, and he, and he pointed out to us, once a year there was this pagan phenomenon that took place, where the water would be miraculously stirred, and people who were put into it would be made whole. The Gospel says an angel came down, because they Christianized, or brought that event into the realm of Christ, because finally Christ is the logic and the fulfillment of all things and of all faiths. This week we celebrated the Feast of Mid-Pentecost where Christ is in the temple. Here is the icon. And he says, He who believes on me from him will flow forth from his belly living waters. That pool of Siloam, that stirring, it was the action of God, action of God the Holy Spirit. That water Christ speaks about is the action of the Holy Spirit, who we know as fire on Pentecost, two Sundays from now, and water in the waters of our baptism. And here we are again, now at the well of Jacob. And Christ encounters this woman. All of the taboos come smashing to the ground. Their hatred for the Samaritans, in Christ is finished. The fear of men speaking to women in Christ is finished. Over. The apostles come and they see this conversation. They see Christ speaking with this woman and they're flummoxed. Not only does he have women among them, but he's speaking to the Samaritan. They didn't like them. They were very much like Jonah, the prophet who was sent to the people of Nineveh, who were his enemies, and didn't want to go, because he knew if he went and he preached that they should repent or God would destroy them, they would. And he wanted them to be destroyed. They were enemies of Israel. He got mad because God saved this city. That's the mindset. When you hear me say Old Testament mindset or Old Testament ways, that's what I mean. An identification of God with a nation or with a ruler, the codifying of social taboos and norms as sin, and their enforcement, where faith becomes a rigid morality of legalism. That's what it was. This woman could very well have been stoned by Christ and his apostles, and they would have been within their rights. Why? Why? Let's reveal. But she finally starts to understand what he's talking about. She says to me, Sir, give me this living water that I may thirst no more. She's starting to understand. And then there's this confrontation. There's a sea change in the conversation that takes place. And he says, Well, go call your husband. right up against the wall. Right up against the very thing that was for her a burden, that was for her the source of her shame among her own people, the Samaritans. It's why she was there at noon and not at sunrise to get water so she would avoid the aspersions and the glances and the words and even possibly being stoned because she was the wife of five husbands and the man she was with now is the husband. 
Christ confronts the issue that separates her from, from God, from her people and from God. How do we understand that? Remember I said the Samaritans only accepted the first five books of the Pentateuch, so we can understand those five husbands as those first five books, if you will. The sixth one, they didn't have. And that was the words of Christ, which will only be revealed now, and not just to the house of Israel, but to the entire world. We can understand that as the law of God that was given in paradise after the fall to Noah, to Abraham, and to Moses, and that final crowning law that comes only with the incarnation of Christ and the adoption of all humanity as his sons and daughters, all humanity, every human person. We can understand those five husbands as our own five senses. We who live for our, what we can see of sensuous, or is it sensual? Sensuous, I always get those two words mixed up. Existence, only what we see and smell and hear and touch and taste and feel. Again, purely earthly, purely carnal, and definitely temporal in nature. If you live for your senses and all of your energy is directed toward your senses being fulfilled, when your soul is separated from your body, what will you have? No eyes, no ears, no tongue, no stomach, no hands. Yet you'll still thirst and hunger and desire for those things to be fulfilled unless you have your sixth sense, which is Christ, which is your intellect, your noose, your noetic faculty that's acquired by prayer and fasting, by mindfulness, constant mindfulness of God, by forgiveness and by love. This woman meets in Christ her true sixth husband. He leads her up from this very confusing at first conversation to an understanding that raised her from ignorance to a theologian. Even when the disciples return with the food, he's not done teaching her or them. Because as I said, they were astonished. It says astonished. I could use a lot of other words to describe it and they wouldn't be as positive. That he'd be talking to this woman, Samaritan. Now what? And he leads them up to He says, you brought food, good. But the food you have is what has been prepared for you by those who came before you. The fruit of the, of the, of the apostle, the fruit of the prophets. Here it is, here she is. The fields, he say, are white for harvest, ripe or white for the harvest. Go into the world and preach the gospel. Here is what your, your food should be, to bring as many people as you can to the knowledge of truth, not to your Old Testament mindsets that tell you that she deserves to be hated and deserves to be stoned. And I deserve as well for speaking to her a punishment. He wants to raise them up too. She returns to the town, emboldened. She goes and she tells people, she actually speaks to people in the town who know her and don't respect her. She says, come and see. Just like Andrew said to the apostles, just like the apostles said, in the Acts of the Apostles, everyone they encountered, come and see. She became from an outcast and a heretic and a sinful woman in the eyes of many, an apostle of Christ to her own people. It says they came out. They came to the well with her to see what she was talking about. This man who told me everything about me, he knew everything about my life. 
Is this not the one? Isn't this the one that Israel is awaiting? After all, in the conversation, he reveals himself to her plainly. He doesn't do that very often. I who speak to you am he. So these hated Samaritans, these occupiers of their lands, these heretics who worship false gods, came out and met Christ. And he stayed with them for two days. They wanted him to remain with them. He stayed with them for two days, teaching, preaching, and they received him joyfully. Not exactly a feather in his cap in the eyes of his apostles. But. So now we have the Samaritans too, that are our followers, really? Okay. It was an effort for them. It was an effort for them to overcome their ancient hatreds, their ingrained hatreds, their identification of them with evil, their identification of their own misfortunes with an affront to God, that Old Testament writes. Where are we? Who are we? What does the church in the world reveal? Does it reveal this all-encompassing love of God? Or is it narrow in its application? I guess that's a rhetorical question. Because if it did, it would be, there would be no room in here today. There shouldn't be any room in here today. There was a return, brothers and sisters. Even Paul, the apostle, they called him Soma Christu, the tongue of Christ. They said without him, we wouldn't have understood Christ's teachings. Nevertheless, he was a product of his time. And he had, in many cases, that Old Testament mindset. 400 years later, St. John Chrysostom, who we attribute today's liturgy to, they call him Stoma Pavlou, the tongue of Paul. Without him, we wouldn't understand what Paul was saying. But by then, the church had entered a new era. It was an era of post-Constantinian uh, edict of Milan. Religion was, uh, Christianity was uh, no longer illegal. And what happened was a drift where again, the church became identified with the state. More so later in the West, but certainly in the East, the church began to identify itself with the state. The emperor looked to them as God and the, the rules and regulations and, and norms and social contracts became codified. And breaking them was identified as sin. This process that Christ began by his incarnation is ongoing. This revelation and this removing of the scales from our eyes and the hardness of our heart is ongoing. Who are we? Are we like this woman? By the way, her name given to her is the Illumined One, Khotini, in Russian, Svetlana. She became the enlightener of the Samaritans. How amazing is that? Are we like her before that conversation with Christ? Or after? Do we live purely for our senses? Or do we acquire and work to acquire a sixth sense, a spiritual intellect? Because that comes through labor, through prayer, through fasting, through mindfulness of God, constant prayer and mindfulness of God and inner attention and silence and stillness and forgiveness and love. This is our chance. This is our time. This life is our pilgrimage. We have this opportunity in this life to acquire that inner spiritual consciousness, that spiritual intellect, that noetic from the noose or noose knowledge of God. To see Him within ourselves, first of all, and in the faces of all those around us, all those around us, and I'll say it the third time, all those around us. 
faces of our sworn enemies, in the faces of those who break societal norms, in the faces of those who we deem evil. It's exactly there we need to seek and find that lost coin, like the widow who swept out her house until she did. And that lost coin is the indelible image of God in every human person. Open our eyes to that reality. Don't think narrowly. And don't turn the church into an extension of your own fears and your own anxieties and your own hatreds and your own prejudices. This is our gradual illumination, yours and mine. Take me 20 years in the priesthood, and it's going to take me the rest of my life to try to figure this out and sort it out. It was easier for God to transform the entire cosmos and than it was for Him to transform my heart, which is so hardened, like a clump of hardened rock. It needs to be crushed. You want to put a seed in the ground? It's springtime, although it feels like summer. You want to put a seed in the ground? You're going to put a seed into hardened, dried up soil? No, you're going to crush it. You're going to plant it and you're going to water it with the Holy Spirit, that living water. And then it will bring forth fruit. It will bring forth fruit that springs up unto life eternal. Christ is risen. Thank <laughs> you.